It's a good little chorus. So we're, uh, guys, we're continuing our series. If you're, uh, if you're here for the first time or if you're returning after a while, we've been in a series called uh, Character Building. And uh, we've been looking at some biblical characters and learning some character traits from those biblical characters that, that I think are, are so very important to us and some of the reasons why they are in Scripture and why these, uh, the stories of the lives of these people are recorded for us. And uh, we've seen some people like uh, Samuel and, and, and Ruth and, and Esther and who else? Gideon, right? You guys remember? That was, that was way back, a while back. But tonight I want to talk to you about one of the most important virtues, at least in my opinion. And I think it's probably one of the most important to God, which is why it should be one of the most important to us. And it's, it's the virtue of integrity. Integrity. Let me, uh, let me start off with, with a little bit of interaction here. Everybody say integrity. All right. So I, I read a story a while, a while back about a guy in, uh, in downtown Chicago. Am I, am I loud or am I good to you guys? Am I good? All right. The guy in downtown Chicago, and, and that's actually where I went to school, and so I know that there's a lot of different kinds of people in the, in the inner city. But this guy uh, came across a trash bag, and it, it looked like, it, or not a trash bag, but a bag, and it, it looked like it was pretty full, and he opened it up, and it was full of cash. It was full of cash. As a matter of fact, he learned later it was $27,000 in cash. And uh, he saw that there was a, a name in there, and there was the name of a bank, and that bank was actually right across the street. And so he picked up the bag, and he walked across the street to this bag. He walked in with this bag full of cash and said, hey, I found this on the other side of the street. Does this belong to, to, to you? It has the name of your bank on it. And they, they, uh, they looked, you know, kind of looked at all their inventory and, and, and everything, and they said it wasn't, it wasn't theirs. And so the guy was like, well, it's got to belong to somebody. So then he actually... Uh, called the police and said, hey, I'd like to find who this money belongs to. And the police showed up, and, and uh, after the, the bank calling around for a while, they, they realized that uh, it was money that was supposed to be a, for an ATM of another branch of that bank, but it had fallen out the back of the armored truck. Um, I don't know how you just kind of allow almost 30 grand to fall off the back of a truck, but, but, it, but it happened. And the police, in, in their statement, said that they were amazed that... Uh, this man had been so honest and not only just tried to return it to the bank, but then even after that tried to find where the money belonged. And they said they, they recommended that he should receive an, an award, but uh, that nothing had been given so far. But the bottom line here is that they were shocked. They were absolutely shocked at, at the honesty of this man. And, and to me, guys, it's tragic that we live in a world where we're more shocked with integrity than we are with lack of integrity. You guys know what I'm talking about? We're more shocked when someone is honest than, than, than when people are, are, are dishonest. We're more shocked when someone does the right thing when, when, than the people who don't do the right thing. And so my question is, why is that? Well, listen, I mean, you guys know you can turn on the news almost any day and you can see stories of people who lack integrity, right? It could be an athlete that everybody loved and respected, and we thought, man, not only are they a great athlete, but they're a great person or any, really any other kind of celebrity. And then it turns out this person had a, a whole other life going on that nobody knew about, and, and, and man, we're, we're like, oh, well, not, not really all that shocked, right? And, it, you know, it, it's not just those kind of people. Obviously, you know, politicians, we actually come to expect now that they're just not very honest people. <laughs> They're just not really people who have a whole lot of integrity. But then sometimes it's the Christian leader, right? It's the pastor, the minister, the evangelist that said one thing and, and really portrayed one thing on the outside, but, but then somehow it came to light that, that this whole double life was going on. And we see that, and honestly, these things are not all that rare. And it's not just leaders who, who are visible, but it's people all around us. It's maybe a close friend, right, who you thought, you know, you, you had a, a good friendship and relationship going on, but then all of a sudden they turn on you or, or they turn on their family. And really the bottom line, the reasoning for it is that there was a failure in the area of integrity. And so what is exactly what is integrity? Let me build a quick working definition of integrity for us tonight. And this isn't one that you'll find in the dictionary, but but this is really as simple as I can make it. Integrity is when your behaviors match your beliefs. When your behaviors match your beliefs. Let me say it a different way. When what you do matches what you say, right? And so, and so the opposite of, of integrity would really be hypocrisy, right? When you say one thing or, or, or portray one thing, and, and, but you act a completely different way. 
And so really, integrity is an integrated lifestyle. It's integrated in the way that what you say lines up with what you do. It's when your, your private life matches your public life. Someone has said it this way, integrity is what you do when no one else is around, when no one else is looking. It's, it's really different than your reputation. I think you guys get this, right? Reputation is who people think you are, but your integrity, your, your character or your lack of integrity is who you really are. It, it's when your behaviors line up with your beliefs. In fact, God desires and rewards integrity in our lives. Proverbs 11.3, it's one of my recent memory verses that I've been working on. It says, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them. And so we're continuing our series tonight, guys. What's it called again? Character building. All right, good. Three of you are still with me. Um, but I want to learn a little bit about integrity, see what we can learn, see, see how we can build it into our lives by looking at the life of David. Uh, some of you, I think, remember maybe a few, few weeks ago, we saw that David was the great-grandson of Ruth and Boaz, right? And, and most of you know that, that King David had some amazing successes in his life when it came to, to integrity, as well as some massive failures. And so I want to start by looking at one of his successes. If you have your Bibles, turn with me over to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. And, and in the context, as you turn there, let me tell you what's going on. David is being chased down by, by Saul. David has been anointed the next king of Israel. Uh, Saul is the current king, and he's not all that happy that, that David is going to replace him. And so he decides, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of David. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill him. And so he gets his, his men, his armies, and, and they try to track him down, and they try to kill him. And so David is, is, is running for his life. I mean, that's really the simplest way to put it. He's, he's hiding. He's living in caves. He's, he's just trying to survive another day. And so here in, in chapter 24, there's actually an opportunity that arises for David to, to, to end this whole thing, to, to be able to stop running. Saul comes in t into a cave to rest, to kind of take a little nap, a little siesta, if you will, right? That's the Hebrew word for nap. And, uh, and he doesn't know that deeper in that cave, David and his men are, are, are already there. They're hiding already in that cave. And so that's where we're going to pick up the story. Everyone find it, 1 Samuel 24. Say amen if you're there. All right, good. Uh, verse 4, look at verse 4. It says, and the men of David said to him, here is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So notice here, firstly, guys, that not only does David not take the opportunity as Saul falls asleep to kill him, but he's actually convicted. He actually feels bad about just what he did do, which is just cutting off like a corner of his robe, right? That, 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 that he shouldn't be doing this to the person that God has anointed to be king. And so look, now look at verse 8. It says, Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul. He said, My lord, the king, this is after Saul had gotten up and walked out, not knowing anything that had just happened. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. Verse 9, And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you. But I spared you. I said, I will not put my hand out against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. So David is saying, listen, I could have, I could have easily killed you. You never would have even known. You were sound asleep, right? But I did what was right. I knew that wasn't the right thing to do. And, 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 and now look at Saul's response. This is, this is pretty interesting. Down in verse 17. It says, Saul said to David, you are more righteous than I. For you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. Notice that even, even Saul here notices that David has integrity. 
He notices his integrity. And actually, verse 20, he admits that, that, you know what, David, you should be the next king. But of course, we know that Saul is a man who lacks integrity, right? So not only does he not call off the chase, but he, he continues trying to kill David. And so David, as if the point needs to be made again, if, if you were to look over at chapter 26, you would see David has another opportunity to kill Saul. And he spares his life a second time. And you see, more than even preserving his own life, David here wanted to do what was right. That's integrity. David acted with integrity, and he did it many times. He didn't only act with integrity, but he also wrote about it. Turn over with me to Psalm chapter 15. Um, just turn a little bit to the right. You'll, you'll find Psalm is kind of dead center in your Bible for, for most Bibles. Psalm chapter 15, and this is one of the Psalms that David wrote. And, and I want to read this because it really is a, is a great Psalm that really defines what integrity is. Psalm chapter 15, you guys find it? Yes? Amen? All right. Psalm chapter 15, start looking right at verse 1. David writes, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right. That's integrity. And speaks truth in his heart. Again, integrity. Who does not slander with his tongue, right? And does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Again, integrity. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Again, integrity. He who does these things shall never be moved. Wow, David here in just a few verses outlines all these different things that God wants, the desires of us, these things that, that, that really are definitions of what a man of integrity would do, how he would act. And notice what the Bible says, this man shall never be moved. You won't be moved. You won't be shaken you, you, when you live this way, when your behaviors match your beliefs. But more importantly, when your behaviors match what God says, what God teaches. In fact, I'd like to show you guys tonight four benefits Four benefits from a life of integrity. There, there, there are so many that we could cover tonight. There, there, there are probably hundreds. But, but I want to point out four that I like, four of these benefits of a life of integrity. The first one is this. You'll walk closely with God. Look again at verse 1 over in Psalm chapter 15. David said, O Lord, who shall, shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? David is speaking here of two places. The tabernacle. Right, which was kind of the moving, portable tent that, that God's presence dwelt in as, as the Israelites were in the desert and then eventually came to Jerusalem. And then your holy hill is speaking of, of the temple that would ultimately be the temple that he didn't get to build, but that his son Solomon got to, to, to build. And so these are the places where, where God's presence were. So, so he's saying, who gets to be in your presence, God? Who gets to be close to you? And notice verse 2, God responds, he who walks blamelessly. Or you could paraphrase this, the one who has integrity, right? The one who has integrity. When you live a life of integrity, you can enjoy the ongoing communion and fellowship with, with God, with holy God. I, I like to think of it this way. Let me kind of illustrate it for you guys. Now, now, my kids, my girls, if I teach them our values and they live according to these, these values that we've set in our family. Don't you think that that's going to increase our, our, our relationship, our closeness, our, our, our intimacy, our, our fellowship, right? Versus if I say, you know what, these are our values. This is the way I want to live as a, live as a family. And, and, and one or, or all of my daughters say, you know what, forget you, Dad. We don't want to live that way. That's not how we're going to do things, right? Now, am I going to love any of my daughters any less? No. But is it going to really kind of get in the way of our closeness as a family, of our, uh, of our communion and fellowship? Absolutely, right? And it's the same way with God. It's true with God. When you live according to his values, you can walk with him. You can enjoy his presence daily, moment by moment. And so living a life in, of integrity allows you to be close to God. The second thing, and if you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down, is that you'll be guided by God. You'll be guided by God. Remember... Proverbs 11.3, I read it just a few minutes ago. The Bible says the integrity of the upright guides him. It guides him. 
God will show you when you are doing what's right, day by day, decision by decision, what he wants you to do. What the right thing to do is. He, he will guide you. He will guide you constantly. He will guide you faithfully into what is best. He's not necessarily going to tell you what's five years down the road, right? He's not necessarily going to tell you what's coming around the corner tomorrow. But he's going to tell you in, in, the, in the next moment the right thing to do. This is a promise. Your integrity will guide you. And the third thing I want you to see, guys, a third benefit is this. And this one's important to me personally, and I think it's probably important to some of you all. And that's that you'll have the peace of God. You'll have the peace of God. You'll have a, a constant peace. A peace that's not tied to circumstances. Listen, when you put your head down on your pillow at night, if you're living in a life of integrity, you're not going to have to worry. You, you know what? Oh, man, what if someone finds that out? <laughs> what if someone finds out what I was doing today? What if I get caught? What if my boss finds out what I did? I could lose my job. What if, what if I'm exposed, right? What if my teacher finds out that I cheated on that test? What if my parents find out what I've been looking at on the internet, right? I mean, whatever it is, you don't have to put your head down and, and worry about those things. You have peace. There's no fear of getting caught. There's no fear of getting found out, of being discovered. Listen to Isaiah 32, 17. It says, in the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. What an amazing verse. God, through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, listen, here's, here's what comes from righteousness. Peace. Listen, we live in a world where we have very little peace. Not just, I'm not just talking about wars and conflict, but, but peace within, right? In our lives, in our hearts. And that's because I think so many people are living lives that lack integrity, that lack righteousness. Now, the flip side of this is that I don't know anyone who lays awake at night going, oh, man, I, I hope no one finds out that I did the right thing. <laughs> right? It just doesn't happen. I mean, if, if they know I did the right thing, man, that's not going to be good. I hope they don't find out I did what was right. I mean, that doesn't happen. You're, you're able to just have that peace. Where you know that, that, that to the best of your ability, you're living your life the way that God wants you to. You're doing the right thing. So you'll have the peace of God. And the fourth benefit that I want you guys to see is this. You'll gain trust, respect, and honor from others. Right? We, we've seen three things you, that you get from God. You, you walk closely with God. You be guided by God. You have the peace of God. But then you also gain some, thing from, from, some things from others. Trust, respect, honor when you live a life of integrity. People will follow you. They, they will listen to you. They will seek out your wisdom and advice because they can see, they can discern that you are a person of integrity. We see this in the life of David. Listen to the way he's described in 1 Samuel 18.30. It says, David had more success than all the servants of Saul so that his name was highly esteemed. God blessed David because of his integrity and his name even to this day, Right? thousands of years later is still esteemed by Jews and Christians alike. Guys, integrity is so important. The challenge is, though, so many people are just not people of integrity. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the opposite of integrity is hypocrisy. And if there's one thing that I think, and some of you probably have heard this as well, but one thing that I hear Christians being accused of the most by the unbelieving world, it's probably hypocrisy right? It probably is. As a matter of fact, I've been given that excuse when I've invited someone to church before, you know, I don't want to, there's, you know, there's just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, true, but, but we all are to, to, to some extent, right? The Greek word for hypocrisy actually comes from the ancient theater, the, the world of, of, of acting, and that's really what it means. It means an, an actor, and more specifically, it has to do with, with wearing a mask. You see, in, in, in ancient Greek theater, they, um, they would have one actor often play several different roles. And so to know which character he was portraying at any given time, they would, he would change his masks and be kind of like a mask, like on a stick, right? And, and so they would, they would change the mask so that they could be these different characters, play these different roles. And guys, what, I, what I'm trying to get you to see is that too many Christians are behaving differently or they're wearing different masks depending on where they are. Maybe they have a church mask, right? 
So when they come in here on Thursday night or Sunday morning, they're, you know, saying certain things and acting a certain way, but then they have a school mask or a work mask or, or a mask that they wear when they're on their sports team. But let's just call it what it is. It's hypocrisy, right? And listen, again, we all have some hypocrisy at different points in our lives. We all do, and that's because we're all sinful human beings. We lack integrity. And sometimes it's hard to see it in ourselves, and sometimes we justify it in our own behaviors. But let me tell you guys that God hates it. In fact, if you look at Jesus, you will see in the Gospels that he was much harsher towards hypocrites than he was towards the, the prostitutes, the adulterers, the tax collectors, the people that were, were, were really full of sin and committing all kinds of evil sins. Let me give you an example. Turn over to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And some of you guys are familiar with this passage, starting in verse 25 and following. But, but, but Jesus is going, going to address some people that, that he's going to call out for their hypocrisy. And, and you're going to see in just a minute that he's going to start his, his address to them by saying, woe to you. <laughs> now, whenever Jesus said, woe to you, he was, what he's basically saying is, this is bad. I'm pronouncing judgment, and you have no idea how bad it's going to be for you. All right? So this is probably the last three words you would ever want Jesus to, to, to speak to you. He's pronouncing judgment on them, all right? Matthew chapter 23, you guys find it. Look at verse 25. Jesus says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. What does he call them, guys? Hypocrites. For you, are clean, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within you are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Man, listen, those are, those are some harsh words. Jesus is saying, listen, you guys are play actors, Right? You lack integrity. You're putting on a good game face. You look religious. You look righteous. As a matter of fact, you're looking down on all the people who aren't as righteous as you. You're, you're, you're showing the outside to be clean, but your heart is filthy with sin. Notice he called them blind Pharisees. In other words, you've gotten to a point in your hypocrisy that you can't even see it. You don't even recognize it. You don't even see it. How hypocritical you are. Guys, here's what we need to understand. Here's what we can learn from this. Hypocrisy doesn't start from the outside and, and, and go in, and, and, and neither does integrity, right? It starts from the inside and it comes out. And so we need to be pure on the inside. And so in, in the same way, Jesus says to these, to these Pharisees and these scribes, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, right? You've got this mask going. You're throwing all kinds of money in the offering plate. You're doing all these different things. You're, you're praying so that everyone within a mile radius can hear your prayer, right? You're, you're doing these things to make yourself appear so righteous. But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus says, woe to you who lack integrity. Man. But listen, guys, listen. If we really do some introspection, right, if we really look inside of ourselves, and we're honest, it's so easy to put the little mask on and play the game, isn't it? It's so easy. When really on the inside of the cup, it's dirty before God. It's even easy just to talk about integrity, right? To pretend to be a man or a woman of integrity. But it's our actions that reveal our hearts. And so David wrote this psalm all about integrity, right? And we saw some of these successes that he had where, where he had these opportunities to do something that would be of great benefit to him. But he knew it wasn't right, and so he didn't do it. And so David's display, life displayed integrity. He was a man that God chose to be king. He was, grew up as a shepherd boy, right? No one would have blamed him for killing Saul. 
As a matter of fact, if you remember, the men said, hey, this is your opportunity. I think this is probably what God was talking about when he said he was going to deliver you from Saul. He meant he was going to bring him so you could kill him. But David didn't do it because he knew it wasn't right. We also know that David certainly had some huge failures, right? David committed adultery. And then he murdered the woman's husband. The Bible says, still, even with his failures, that he was a man after God's own heart. And David earnestly begged for forgiveness for those sins. I mean, how do we reconcile these things? How can David be this man of integrity who had these failures, but who still called someone who was seeking to do what God wanted him to do, who who was seeking God's heart, and yet had these huge integrity mistakes? Listen, we've also made mistakes, haven't we? We've also had times where we failed in the area of integrity. But maybe you still want to be a person after God's own heart. How do you do that? This is how David explained, I think, what, 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 what he was really going after. Psalm 25, 21, David said, May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. He valued his integrity, and here he's saying that that he was willing to wait for God to show him what to do. I think what David learned is that possessing integrity is something that God honors. Right? Again, he could have solved this problem in the short term by killing Saul, but then his hope would have been in himself and not in God. David knew that God appointed Saul as king, and he didn't want to kill the one that God had chosen. So he made the right decision because it was the right thing to do. But let me tell you guys, and and I think you need to understand this, and, and this is something that some churches really aren't teaching and preaching, and it's the fact that integrity demands sacrifice, right? You guys understand that. When you have integrity, sometimes it's not going to make things easier. As a matter of fact, many times it's going to make things more difficult. By not killing Saul, it meant that David would have to sacrifice a safe life for the time being. He, he, he sacrificed uh, immediate power, a home, stability, security, the safety of his family. I mean, he could have taken care of that whole situation with one swing of a sword. But he didn't. And his sacrifice also proved to God that he had what it took to lead his people, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And that's the thing about integrity. It often demands short-term sacrifice for long-term success. If you were to fast forward or skip to the next chapter in David's life, you would see that he led God's people. And he did it out of the integrity of his heart. He proved over and over again that he had the ability to make decisions that were uh, God decisions. Because he, he was seeking after this integrity in his heart. As a, matter, listen, as a matter of fact, listen to how the Bible describes his leadership. As king over in Psalm 78, 72, it says, With an upright heart he shepherded them, the, the people of Israel, that is, and guided them with his skillful hand. Man, I would, I would love that to describe me, right? <laughs> that I, whatever I did, that I did it with an upright heart and a skillful hand. And so here's the hard part for us. Listen, we, we can't fast forward to see the results of making the right choice, Right? We can't see how our sacrifice benefits us later, but we can trust God's promise that he makes to us. Promises like in Psalm 10, 9, which says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his way crooked will be found out. Notice when we walk with integrity, we walk securely. We don't have to worry about covering up a lie or making sure that what we did that was wrong is going to get found out, right? Integrity demands sacrifice, but it provides security. It it, it gives us a straight path. But the opposite is also true. Lack of integrity gives us a crooked path, a more difficult path. And so the question really becomes, which path are you on, right? The path where you're really seeking to do what is right, to live a life of integrity. Or a path where, you know what, I'm just going to do what I want to do, whether it's right or wrong. Which leads me to a question, and I think this is probably 
one of the most important questions I'm going to ask tonight. When you look at your life, when you look at your actions, here's the question. What is your integrity worth? Right? What is it worth to you? Not just, you know what, you know, it's worth a lot to me. All right. What does that mean? No, what, what, is, what do your actions say that your integrity is worth? Let's say, you know, you're applying for jobs and you're putting together a, a resume, right, to apply for these jobs. And, 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 and you know what, you know, I can put a couple things on there that you know, I haven't really done or I haven't really accomplished, but it'll make my resume look better. I'll probably get a little bit better job. It'll give me a little bit better pay, right? Well, that little bit better job or that little bit better pay is what your integrity is worth. You just took your integrity and you said you're willing to trade that for some perceived financial benefit, right? That's what your integrity is worth. Maybe you're with your friends and you, you, you have a story you want to tell and, and you know what? You want it to be a good story and you want them to like you and so, you know, I'm just going to exaggerate just a little bit here and there, right? Make the story a little bit better than it probably was. That's what your integrity is worth. Or maybe nobody's around and you're like, you know what, I can pull some stuff up on my phone or on my computer, nobody will ever know. That's what your integrity is worth then. Maybe, maybe you know, you're, you're got a big test coming up and you're looking forward to college and you want to get good grades because you want your GPA to be high so that you can, you know, get into the college that you want to get in and you know what, there's something you could probably do to maybe pretty easily cheat on this test or this paper. Well, that's what your integrity is worth, right? And so what is your integrity worth? Not just what you say, but what does your life demonstrate that it's worth to you? Let me give you a, an example of a guy in the Bible who, at, who, who told us what his integrity was worth to him. Job over in Job chapter 27, some of you guys know this, a guy who suffered more than probably most people who've been alive. In chapter 27, verses 5 and 6, he said this, Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Man, let me tell you, these words, he's saying, he's answering that question, right? He's saying my integrity is worth everything to me. No matter what happens, no matter how bad it is, no matter how crazy the situation gets, I'm not going to give it up. I'm going to do what's right. And so you can take away everything else, Job is saying, but you cannot take away my right to choose to honor God in the way that I live. That's what his integrity was worth. It was worth everything to him. Let me tell you guys, it should be worth everything to us. And so let me ask you another question. What do you do when you realize that you've lacked integrity? Years ago, I had a student in the youth group come and tell me that they were concerned about another student, a fellow student. And they said, you know what? Um, they said this other student, they were just worried about them because they were cussing all the time. Using all these words that they knew they, they shouldn't be using and you know, and I knew this other student pretty well, and so I was a little surprised, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something like, you know, really, that's, that's kind of surprising. And then he looked at me, and he said, well, he doesn't do it when he's around you, Pastor Drew. And I was like, oh. I'm glad to say this, this, this cussing student realized that they were wearing different masks based on where they were and got back on track spiritually and is currently living for the Lord. But, but listen, that's not always what happens, right? And so what do you do when you recognize that you lack integrity? Let me give you guys two things tonight, just two very simple things. The first one and most important thing is this, turn your life over to Jesus. And, 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 I, and, I, and I want to share this because let me tell you right now, you can never live a life of integrity on your own because we're all bent towards sin, right? You guys understand that. You know that. 
The only way that you can live a life of integrity is to turn your life over to Jesus. You see, if we look at the life of David, the pattern of his life was one of integrity, but we saw already that he had some, some massive failures. He was imperfect. He was sinful just like us. But there was one descendant who came from the line of David, one who is often called, as a matter of fact, the son of David, who never failed, who never sinned, who lived his life with perfect integrity 100% of the time. And unless you turn your life over to him by believing that he died for you and receive him as your Lord and Savior, you'll never be good enough and will have to one day pay the consequences for your lack of integrity forever. But here's the good news, right? The flip side to that, if you do turn your life over to Jesus, not only do you receive forgiveness, not only do you, do you receive new life, but you get his perfect integrity and righteousness credited to your account. Think about that for a second. The righteousness of Jesus himself, who never sinned, who never failed, who never lacked integrity, you get it credited to your life, to your account. And you get the spirit of God to live in you, to guide you. And you get one day to spend eternity with God in heaven in a place where there's no pain and no sorrow. Not because of anything that you've done, not because of your own righteousness, but because of what he's already accomplished for you upon the cross. And so listen, guys. It's the first step and it's the biggest step. If you haven't turned your life over to Jesus, there's no better time to do it than now, tonight. But secondly, guys, Secondly is this, even if you have, turn back to God. Turn back to God. Listen, here's what we've seen about David tonight, right? He loved God. God chose him to rule over his people because of his righteous heart. But then he failed miserably in the area of integrity. He committed adultery. He committed murder even though he didn't do it himself. He basically had it ordered done, right? Then he felt so much guilt for his sin. Listen to what he wrote in Psalm 38, 4. He said, for my iniquities, that's my sins, my, my lack of integrity, have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. He felt like he was drowning or being crushed by the, the weight of your, his sins. I don't know if you guys have been there, right? That's a horrible place to be. Then he was confronted with his sins by a prophet, and, and he repented of them, saying in Psalm 51, 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And so this same person who had so much integrity that he was a man after God's own heart, he, he stumbled along the way. He felt like he was drowning under the weight of his sin. He turned back to God, and he was able to write these beautiful words in Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. He said, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his God's steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. Think about that, right? They're as far away as possibly can be. So great or so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Man. David failed so badly that he realized so amazingly how great God's forgiveness is. And listen, you all can experience that as well, right? If you failed and lacked integrity and you repent as David did and turn back to God, you can receive the same forgiveness. David said when he was confessing and repenting to God in Psalm 51, which by the way, I don't have time to get into it tonight, but it's, it's an amazing psalm. I recommend if you haven't read it in a while to go back and just read the powerful words that, that he read. He just pours out his heart. But in verse 6, he says, behold, speaking to God, you delight in truth in the inward being. That's what he knew God wanted from him, right? Truth, integrity, righteousness on the inside that's being lived out on the outside. David knew, and, and, and I think you guys know, that's what God wants. Integrity from the inside out so that you become a person of your word as, as Christ lives through you. We complicate it, but it's really that simple. To let your behavior line up with your beliefs. But more importantly, to line up with God's beliefs. And when you do, guys, we've already seen, right? You'll be close to God. You'll walk closely with God. You'll be guided by God. You'll have a peace from God. And you'll gain honor, trust, and respect from those around you. But you know where we have to start, right? We have to take off the dumb little masks. <laughs> we got to get rid of them. 
We have to do what's right no matter the situation and let God work. Because it really does matter. Listen, when you have integrity, when you have integrity, it's what will define you, right? But when you lack integrity, don't kid yourself. You're not going to have a good relationship with God. You're not going to have a good relationship with your parents. Your lack of integrity will define you as well. And so it's tragic to me. It's so sad when the world is more shocked by integrity than they are by a lack of integrity. Listen, we need, we need to commit to, to live an integrated life under the, the submission to Christ and allow our behaviors by the power of the Holy Spirit to line up with our beliefs, to line up with God's word, and through his power be people of integrity. And again, we understand that, that, that integrity sometimes is going to demand sacrifice. It means making the choices that, you know what, it could cost you some friends. It could cause some persecution from the world, but it means, much more importantly, gaining God's approval. And so how would your life be different? How would your life be different if you were just really known to be a person of integrity? Would it inspire your friends? Would others be drawn to you and, and, and be drawn to God, and able, enabling you to, to bring them to Christ? Would you experience God's presence in your life? Would, would God guide you step by step, decision by decision? Would you have a peace that surpasses understanding? Would you earn respect in the eyes of others? But more importantly, would you bring glory to God? Let me tell you tonight, all of those, absolutely. Absolutely. And not only do I know this, but David knows, knew this. He wrote in Psalm 41, verses 11 and 12, he said, By this I know that you delight in me, speaking to God. Say, so, you know what, I'm going to give you guys a little, little secret, right? This is how to know that God delights in you. That God is, that God is with you, that he's happy with, with what you're doing, with how you're living. He says in verse 12, that you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. That God delights in him and he's upholding him. It's the idea of, of, of support. Of, of bringing someone up so that they can do what God has called them to do because of his integrity. And because of that, notice David says that he is set in God's presence forever. And so guys, listen, I just want to encourage you tonight to walk with integrity. And I hope you understand this, that your future and your fruitfulness for God depends on it. And not just yours, right? Not just yours, but that of your children one day as well. Proverbs 27 says, The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. What an amazing verse. That not only do we get to reap some of the benefits of our integrity, but our children get to reap those benefits as well. And so let me ask you just one final question tonight. Do you think that we can do what's right more often than not? I think with the power of God and the Holy Spirit, it's possible, right? Do you think that we can walk in integrity? Do you think that we can allow our behaviors to match our beliefs? I think we can. And I think it's going to set us apart in a world where integrity and righteousness and truth is not the norm. And people will be drawn to it. And then we'll have the opportunity for God to work in us and through us for his kingdom and for his glory. And when he does, you'll get to experience his power. And guys, there's no greater joy. And so let's do what's right. Let's live our lives for God. Understanding that integrity is so very important to him, it should be important to us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the examples that you've given us in Scripture. We thank you for the example of David and the many times that he gave us the right example of doing what is right no matter the cost. 
But God, we can also learn from him that when we do fail, that you're there waiting for us to turn back to you, extending forgiveness, ready to take our iniquities as far away from us as the east is from the west. And so God, I pray that you would give us tender hearts, that you would search us as David said and, and find if there be any wicked way in us, any areas where God, where we're just play acting, where we're wearing different masks, where we're harboring hypocrisy. And that God, as you identify maybe some of those areas that you would help us to, to confess it, just to say that it's wrong, and then to repent of it, to turn back towards you. God, we thank you for so, so many amazing promises in Scripture. God, we thank you that if we seek integrity, if we seek to do what's right each and every time, that you promise to guide us, to be near to us, to give us a peace that surpasses understanding. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us the courage, the strength, the boldness to go after what is right. God, to seek this integrity in our hearts and the inside of us, God, that it's reflected in everything that we say and do. God, we're so thankful for your love and, and grace and mercy. That even though we've sinned against you, you've provided a way through Jesus Christ. That upon that cross that he paid for each and every one of those sins. And that he offers us forgiveness as a free gift that only needs to be received. And not just forgiveness, God. But his very righteousness credited to our accounts. So that when you look at us, those who believed and received Jesus, you don't see our long list of sins and failures of integrity. But you see the righteousness of your son who's already paid for our sins. God, we're so thankful for that tonight. We're humbled by the opportunity that you give us to be your servants, to do your will. And so God, give us the courage and the strength to do it well to do it right, to do it with integrity. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, thanks, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. We'll uh, maybe be in the next part of the series next week, or maybe it'll be in a different lesson. I'm not quite sure yet. But um, you guys enjoyed this series so far? Yeah, so many, so many great characters in Scripture, and they're there for, for important reasons. If you missed some of them, if you weren't here for some weeks, they all are all available online, so you can, uh, you can go back and, and, uh, and watch them. I have a hard time doing that because I have a hard time watching myself. Anybody ever do that before? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's just weird. I mean, I, I, I force myself to do it here and there just so I can hopefully learn from my inadequacies. But um, anyways... Um, Hopefully you'll come back next week. Uh, we'll, we'll be uh, either, again, in another part six of this series or, or maybe uh, something else. But just a couple of things to point to in May, right, because May is right around the corner. Um, we are going to have uh, a youth takeover night, all right? I'm not exactly sure uh, which Thursday of May that's going to be, but most of you know that's where you all take over and do uh, everything that's done on a Thursday night. So, uh so I'm excited about that. We, we, we do that every year, and it's, uh, I think it's always neat to, uh, to, for me at least, and I think for all of us, to see the many talents and gifts and abilities that you all have. Um, we're also going to have, a, uh, which is, again, a tradition, but uh, we'll have our senior night at the end of May, and so we'll be, uh, we'll be honoring our seniors who are graduating and going on to amazing things, uh, whatever, whatever and wherever that is. Uh, I'm also speaking at graduation, actually, for CBCCA, so, <laughs> so I'll be speaking at graduation, then I'll be speaking at senior night, two different lessons, maybe, or maybe I'll just do the same one again, no, um, 
But, uh, but hopefully I'll have something encouraging for you guys, for our seniors as they, uh, as they graduate and move on. Uh, so a couple, those are a couple of things. I think uh, also maybe one Thursday in May. Maybe uh, he's not here tonight, but uh, I was thinking of having Zach teach again. How about that? You guys enjoy that? Yeah, Zach, he did a great job last month, I think, when he taught. Um, so uh, so we'll, we'll be looking at that as well. Um, one additional announcement that I didn't have a slide for, which because I forgot to put it in there, but um, I just want to mention Camp Grace Mission Trip is a go for this summer. So uh, it's June 20th to the 26th. Uh, a bunch of you have been before, right? Several of you. Uh, it's uh, outside of Macon, Georgia. It's an amazing camp. It's going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, just fewer people mainly, spaced out a little bit more because of this. I don't know if you guys heard about this thing called COVID, but it's apparently a thing. Um, now, anyways, but uh, so we're taking a mission team. We're going to go help. Uh, we've done a lot of things over the past few years, but a new thing is cleaning and sanitizing that needs to be done. So, uh, so we'll probably be helping out with that quite a bit over the course of the week. But amazing opportunity, amazing camp, beautiful place. God has, has done powerful things there. So um, applications are available uh, over in the main building. I'll try to bring some over next Thursday. I think the application deadline, if I remember correctly, is June 1st. Um, so think about that. Pray about that. Um, there are, I think, limited spaces available um, so that we can... I was going to say be social distance, but I don't know. Anyways, um, so think about that. That is the Camp Grace mission trip coming up uh, at the end of June. So keep that on your radar. Be praying about it. Maybe that's something God wants you to do. We're still trying to maybe get in some international trips in the fall, maybe, potentially. Lord willing, uh, October, November time frame. It's just really, really difficult still to plan anything international as so many places are still closed and... Um, I don't know, all kinds of different regulations. So anyways, just letting you know, it's, it's a potential possibility in the October, November time frame, mainly looking at Ukraine and South Africa as, as, uh, as trips maybe later on. But Camp Grace is, uh, is a go in June, so that's just a couple hours away, so pretty easy trip. All right, thanks again for coming tonight, guys. Appreciate you all. Uh, have a great week, and I will uh, hopefully see you next Thursday if I don't see you before.